Thank you so much for having me, East Berlin. Um, I'm from America. <laughs> Big applause for America. I'm here from America, and I'm here to frighten you. So this talk is um, obviously uh, triggered in a way by the Tornado Cash prosecutions. A show of hands uh, that you are familiar with Tornado Cash. Good. I would hope so in a room like this. So there was a starting pistol to the Tornado Cash prosecutions. We've recently seen a verdict in Alexei Pertsov's case. And there was uh, an indictment of Roman Storm and Roman Semenov, all three of them co-developers of the Tornado Cash privacy tool. The starting pistol was in August of 2022, and it was OFAC, a division of the US Treasury, designating Tornado Cash as a sanctioned entity. So what does that mean, and how far do US sanction laws reach, and could they, in fact, endanger or cause liability for you as developers? First, though, because I am a lawyer, a disclaimer. I work at Coin Center. Coin Center is a nonprofit research and education organization based in Washington, DC. We've existed since 2014. We educate people in government so that they can hopefully make reasonable policies out of a position of knowledge rather than bad and dangerous policies from a position of ignorance. Our job these days is primarily to defend your civil liberties when you are in the digital world. I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. So I need to say this because I don't want anyone to be confused. When I talk about the law, when I talk about the First Amendment of the US Constitution or the German Basic Law or any constitutional undergirding principle of free speech or privacy, I will make broad arguments for why what we do building these privacy protecting tools, building these censorship resistant softwares, why that should be protected as First Amendment protected speech, as free speech. That said, do not rely on my interpretations. If you are actually working in this space, you need to talk to a lawyer. A previous speaker mentioned you can often find lawyers who will give free legal advice because they will take a consultation with you. If that's all you can afford, at least do that. Do not rely on public statements. Find a lawyer who knows your specific situation, what you're building, and have a conversation. And then you can judge your risk appetite. My job is to shift the Overton window in policy circles so that ultimately when things do end up in court, we have strong and reasonable and well-socialized arguments for why the government is out of line, why their prosecution extends beyond the bounds of First Amendment protected speech, and why it also extends beyond the bounds of narrowly written criminal law statutes like money laundry statutes or sanction statutes. So a little bit of table setting about sanctions laws. Um, this is one of two talks I'm giving on this trip to Berlin. I'm from Washington, DC, and I feel very lucky to have been invited here to speak and see this beautiful city. Both talks deal with the implications of recent tornado cash prosecutions. This talk focuses on sanctions laws. The other talk, which I gave yesterday at DAPCON, focuses on money laundering charges and unlicensed money transmission charges and the nature of conspiracy liability for software development generally. Uh, and we also cover the Samurai Wallet indictment, which was a Bitcoin wallet that's recently had developers of it indicted in the Southern District of New York. That was yesterday at DAPCON. I think it's available on YouTube now, so if it's, if it's interesting you, please check it out. So some key background concepts on sanctions laws. What are they? <laughs> the International Emergency Economic Powers Act is a law that was passed by Congress back in the 20th century. It replaced something called the Trading with the Enemy Act, and that actually is a more elucidative, more helpful uh, title for a bill to understand what this is about. This is about geopolitics. It is probably true that sanctions are the most powerful geopolitical tool in the 21st century because we don't usually see major nations go to war. That's starting to change very frighteningly. But generally speaking, the worst thing we can do to an enemy or rogue state is cut them fully off from the global financial system and hope that the regime starved of resources eventually crumbles under the weight of its own mismanagement. That's the reason for sanctions laws, and there are some good arguments for why sanctions laws do actually matter in that context. That's a huge debate. I'm not intending to impugn all of sanctions laws in this talk. 
What I want to talk about is the overreach of sanctioned laws into ways that actually quelch and extinguish free and innovative speech and, in, and, and new technologies. So under the Emergency Powers Act, the president is empowered to create a list. We call it the specially designated nationals list, the SDN list. And this list is a list of people and their property and their aliases quite often. And what that means is if your name is on that list, Americans are banned from transacting with you. And that means that if you are on that list, you will have trouble getting a bank account. You will have trouble engaging in international commerce. You will have trouble getting your contracts uh, honored. You will be effectively out in the cold of the global financial system. It's a severe penalty used as a stick to try and keep rogue nations and terrorists hopefully in line or starved of resources. What are the limits of sanctions laws? There are statutory limits. So the International Emergency Economic Powers Act allows the president to sanction people or property in which a sanctioned person has a definable property interest. And this is very relevant to the tornado cash prosecution because the immutable smart contracts that form the backbone of that privacy tool, I would argue, are not the property of any person, sanctioned or not sanctioned. They do not enrich any person when people use those privacy tools, and they do not uh, yield to the control of any person. They are as immutable as the Ethereum blockchain itself, based on the way that they were ultimately designed and deployed to the network. So I would argue that in sanctioning the Tornado Cash immutable smart contracts, the limits that were intended to apply to sanctions laws have been overstepped. And in America, we have a very strong tradition of a separation of powers and a narrow interpretation of statutory authority. So yes, the president through the treasury, through the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, sanctioned Tornado Cash. They have that power, right? Well, no, the only power they have is the power that Congress gave them when they passed the International Economic Emergency Powers Act. And that power is constrained to people and the property of people. It doesn't extend to software. If Congress had intended to give the president the power to sanction software in the abstract or smart contracts, then they would have drafted a law that way and passed it. The other limit to sanctions laws, the Berman Amendments. There is a long history, starting with the Trading with the Enemy Act, going up into IEPA, where those who are tasked with creating policy for sanctions have tried to stretch that power to cover all manner of information transactions, to block the free flow of ideas across borders. Congress never intended that. In fact, when they saw art dealers and book resellers being prosecuted for sanctions evasion in the 70s and onwards, they passed two laws to explicitly carve out information transactions from the reach of the president's prohibition powers. These are the Berman Amendments and the Free Trade and Ideas Act. They do not allow any direct or indirect prohibition on transactions and information. And finally, there are constitutional limits to the sanctions laws. We have a First Amendment in the US, we have free speech. And therefore, you are allowed to publish a book. Even if the author is Iranian and a member of the Iranian government, you can publish that person's book in the US because that is a speech act. Also, we have due process requirements. This is why if you happen to be an American, you're in a little bit less danger of sanctions laws than if you happen to be someone in, say, Germany. It's because sanctions are an incredibly aggressive penalty. You get cut off from the global financial system. You get cut off from business relationships. And in the US, US citizens are entitled to have the charges against them clearly articulated, to have an attorney, to have a trial in front of a neutral magistrate, and to have a judge and jury decide if they're actually guilty all before they are punished. And sanctions have none of that. Your name just ends up on a list, and the penalties go from there. That's why you do not see Americans added to the SDN list, because it would violate the due process clause of the Constitution. Unfortunately, foreign persons do not get the benefit of our due process clause in all cases. That's something that would be worth challenging in courts, but it is something 
that is a limit to the limit. Limits to these limits. Any kind of interest in a thing from a sanctioned person makes it subject to sanctions. This is the argument that the tornado cash prosecutors in the Southern District of New York are making with respect to the tornado cash immutable pools. They're basically saying, yes, you're right. We're only allowed to sanction the property that sanctioned persons have an interest in. But interest doesn't mean your typical property right. It could just mean that they get positive externalities from the success of the other thing. And that's effectively their argument, that because certain persons in the Tornado Cash ecosystem benefit from other people's un otherwise unaffiliated usage of the Tornado Cash privacy pools, because maybe the torn token price goes up, therefore they are earning a return, getting an interest, if you will, in the use of that immutable tool, and therefore that immutable tool is actually a property of theirs which can make it subject to sanctions. This is an incredibly broad theory of the reach of sanctions laws. You would basically be able to sanction an automobile manufacturer because Iran happens to have a lot of oil, and the more people buy cars, the better for Iran's oil stores. This has to have a limit, but this is being disputed in court right now, including in a lawsuit that we're bringing. Finally, custom-made information products to be produced after the transaction. So the Berman Amendment carves out information transactions. It says, if all you were doing was licensing software, or selling a book, or buying a piece of artwork, sanctions laws aren't supposed to apply to you. The regulator, OFAC, has narrowed what was previously a very clear and broad statutory carve-out for information transactions. In the biggest way they've narrowed it is by saying that if you contract with someone to write a book on spec, you'll pay them to write the book, but they haven't written the book yet, and they might do it in a way that's better for you, or you might do things for them going forward that are better for them. This is no longer a transaction information, it's basically a labor contract, and therefore it's subject to sanctions. And so the argument would be here, would be even if all you're doing is presenting a PowerPoint presentation, if you're presenting it to the North Koreans, you're giving them custom-made information in an in-person context based on their desires as you're talking. And this is no longer just a discrete piece of information that you've transacted. Now you're in an ongoing sort of agency or labor-like relationship with a sanctioned entity. And this is the carve-out from sanctions laws that Virgil Griffith, the Ethereum developer, ended up on the wrong side of uh, and ultimately pled guilty uh, rather than go to trial when he was persecuted for sanctions uh, evasion or sanctions violations. How does one comply with sanctions in crypto and in traditional finance? So some things to note, sanctions laws apply to everyone. This is contrasted with Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering regimes, which typically only apply to defined categories of persons and businesses like financial institutions. Unlike those AML KYC requirements, Every person, even if you're just an ordinary person, is obligated to obey sanctions laws. U.S. persons in many ways bear the brunt of these obligations because they are the ones that are prohibited from transacting with persons on the SDN list. So because the Tornado Cash smart contract pools are on the SDN list, I as an American am no longer allowed to use Tornado Cash because sending my money to those pools would be sending money to a quote unquote sanctioned person, even though it's an immutable robot. However, it also applies to non-US persons. So in a tri-seal declaration of March 2024, quite recently, and possibly released in part because of the events that we're discussing today, the uh, Office of Foreign Asset Controls and two other agencies, hence tri-seal, tri said that foreign persons are also obligated to comply with US sanctions if they are um, causing a violation of any license order regulation or prohibition issued. So if you cause an American to pay a sanctioned person and you're not an American, you are actually at risk of prosecution, even though you are not in a very direct and clear way subject to sanctions laws, these agencies think you are, if you're inducing or causing or otherwise facilitating Americans violating these laws. And finally, in the sub-bullet under US persons, secondary liability for aiding, abetting, conspiring to transact with sanctioned persons or property. The charges against Roman Storm and Roman Semenov in the Southern District of New York are conspiracy charges. So the government doesn't even need to prove that they actually violated sanctions. 
It needs to prove that they agreed with co-conspirators named and unnamed, the relayers in that system, perhaps even the Ethereum miners, who of course, because of incentives, will mine the blocks that they submit valid transactions to, and that altogether there was an agreement to assist persons violating sanctions, as when North Korea used the tornado cash pools, allegedly, in order to launder hacking proceeds. So this is a wide reach of liability. These laws do still have the limits described before. Prohibiting transactions and information is not okay, generally. And sanctions should identify an actual person and an actual person's property rather than talk about sanctioning software in the abstract. But that will ultimately depend on whether we win our lawsuit that Coin Center is bringing in the 11th District uh, Appellate Court. Crypto. Some compliance steps are pretty straightforward. On the SDN list, there are Bitcoin addresses and there are Ethereum addresses. And if you are, say, thinking about who you should pay, you could check against that list and not pay that list. If you are a validator or a miner, and that is your business, especially if it's a highly profitable business, you could check against that list and simply not put transactions with those addresses in your blocks. Are you obligated to do that? I'm not your lawyer, but I wouldn't not do it if I was running a highly profitable business because I don't want to end up in jail. Is this justice? I don't know. Other types of compliance are even more difficult, though. What if you put a transaction in a block and you didn't know that it was a sanctioned person because their address hasn't ended up on the list yet, but they do control that address? Are you liable then? For civil penalties, sanctions laws are strict liability. They don't even need to prove that you knew that that transaction was sanctioned. They just need to show that you actually facilitated it. That's a very dangerous criminal statute. And one way of framing the incredible breadth of sanctions laws in practice here is by saying that we're actually really just, when we're building these networks and we're hoping to do it in a legal and compliant way, we're fighting for our right to do what SWIFT does. Show of hands if you know what SWIFT is. Good, good. This is a great audience. <laughs> SWIFT, by far, is the largest interbank settlement network the world has ever seen. It settles trillions of dollars in transactions between major banks around the world every year. Now, SWIFT, do they, are they subject to sanctions laws? This is actually a difficult question to answer. When pressed by the Belgian government, because SWIFT is based as a nonprofit, a trade association of bankers, if you will, in Brussels, Belgium passed a law saying organizations like SWIFT, they're actually mentioned in the law, must debank Iranian banks. This was in, in response to events in Iran a few years ago. And they did. However, those are Belgian laws specifically calling on SWIFT to do things. If I, as an American, use my bank to pay a sanctioned person at a bank in Cuba, that is also a sanctioned transaction, my bank will probably catch that and stop me. But if my bank doesn't, SWIFT is going to relay that message. Are they responsible for the content of that message? Because God knows Tornado Cash developers were responsible, even if they didn't know that the underlying transaction was sanctioned. Is SWIFT responsible? It should be fair, right? They should be responsible too. Well, the short answer is no, not really. If this is an interesting debate, you should follow my discussion, my somewhat civil discussion with John Paul Koenig on Twitter. Um, these are the actual things that SWIFT has said with respect to whether they're obligated. Responsibility for ensuring that individual financial transactions comply with sanctions rests with the financial institutions handling them and their competent authorities. SWIFT is only a messaging service, has no involvement in or control over the underlying financial transactions. And you can see that there's more. What we want to build is neutral financial rails for the global economy that aren't excluding good people that aren't excluding poor people, that aren't excluding people with weird ideas that others don't yet trust but could actually make the world a lot better. We want neutral infrastructure. We just want to be a messaging provider. But can we? SWIFT can do it. Can we? I don't know. So how are we fighting these attacks on our ability to build these systems? We're fighting them in a few ways. Civil lawsuits. The basic principle at stake in these civil lawsuits is, can the US Treasury identify immutable smart contracts, let alone mutable smart contracts? That's a whole nother topic. 
But can they, in fact, identify immutable smart contracts and say that they are sanctioned entities, thereby banning Americans from using them, as in the case of Tornado Cash, and creating liability for any non-US person who helps a US person use them? There are two lawsuits that are ongoing. In the Fifth Circuit, out of Texas, Van Loon, who is a developer in Texas, his lawsuit's been financed um, very generously by Coinbase, because they understand how dangerous this issue is, is suing the Treasury on this question. And in the 11th Circuit, my organization, Coin Center, is also suing the Treasury on this same theory. We say, look, we're an American nonprofit. We received donations using Tornado Cash. We received several donations before the sanctions using Tornado Cash. We'd like to continue doing that. And by the way, because we're a nonprofit that does political advocacy, anonymous donations are First Amendment protected assembly and speech. We have a right to continue receiving these donations, and you have no right to stop them in this case. And beyond that, the way you've chosen to stop them by sanctioning an immutable smart contract violates the strictures, the limits, as we argue, to US sanctions laws. If this case is interesting to you, you can follow this QR code to find a link to our complaint in the district court level. How else are we fighting? Criminal defense, the basic principle at stake in these cases. Can the developer of immutable smart contracts and associated software-based user interfaces be held criminally liable for sanctions evasion if those tools are used by sanctioned persons or by Americans to pay sanctioned persons? And I think you're all familiar. In the Southern District of New York, Roman Storm and Roman Semenov have been indicted and accused of sanctions evasion for developing the Tornado Cash tools. Coin Center filed an amicus brief on the information transaction exemptions, the Berman Amendment information exemptions that I explained earlier. And the DeFi Education Fund filed an excellent amicus brief on the unprecedented nature of this particular application of sanctions liability. In every past case where somebody was held responsible for violating sanctions, they had had some kind of actual agreement or contract with a sanctioned entity to do something like develop software. In no past case had they just been a publisher of infrastructure software that was available to anyone and happened to end up liable because the wrong person used it. And I think that's the right outcome. If these are interesting to you, this is our amicus brief in, in the Roman Storm case, and this is the DeFi Education Fund's also excellent amicus brief. They're both um, worth the read, and they're, they're written by lawyers to argue in front of judges, but these are lawyers trying to explain technologies to judges who are not technology native, so they're very accessible. They're written, hopefully, in a way that is both easy to understand and persuasive. What to make of this, briefly? This is the beginning, maybe it started a few years ago, actually, of the second crypto war. The first crypto wars were in the late 90s about strong encryption. One big fight in that war was US export control laws and the argument that developers of strong crypto systems aren't allowed to export those software tools outside of the US because they are munitions and therefore trading them outside of the US is trading with the enemy effectively. We're back to that now. The geopolitics of pushing sanctions laws to the extreme are very real. We're seeing them with criminal liability for people who are merely developing software. We're seeing them also in the traditional financial system as we threaten to remove more and more countries from SWIFT under the name of sanctions, we risk the stability of the global economy and the throughput of these important financial systems. Maybe our systems rot around that damage, but at what cost to our own personal well-being? This is a heckler's veto for technology. The reason I can't use Tornado Cash anymore is because North Korea did. Why does North Korea, with its insane totalitarian regime, get to veto my right as an American to use a good software tool? It's bullshit. And the policymakers who think this is a good policy are just dead wrong. The double standard with SWIFT. I covered that already. And I expect to argue with JP Moore on Twitter soon. Backwards-looking intent standards. This is really relevant to developers. The Lazarus Group, allegedly North Korean hackers, used the Tornado Cash pools after they had been made immutable by the developers. 
How can you intend for specific sanctioned entities to get the benefit of your tools if you published them and relinquished all control of them before those bad actors even stuck their head out of the ground and used those tools? Criminal laws are supposed to prove intent, that you wanted them to do this, that you wanted to help them do this bad thing. You can't help someone you haven't even met yet. Software and more. This is also very relevant to a developer conference. If all you're doing is publishing speech in a book, you know, publish your Solidity code in a book, write it down in a book, that's what you should do this week, is learn how to write Solidity out long form. You're gonna get First Amendment protection now. It's a bad joke, I'm sorry. If you publish it to a GitHub repository, you're a step closer. If you publish it to the Ethereum blockchain, quote unquote, deploy it, which I would say is still just publishing speech, you're in another world of potential liability. If you then also start a DAO, start a front end, maintain a web server, run coordination servers, run relayers, at a certain point, what you're doing may not get the protections of the First Amendment or other speech protective uh, constitutional norms like the German Basic Law. And where that line falls, I don't think any good lawyer can tell you with any certainty, and that's really scary. So if you can build your stuff like Satoshi and just publish a white paper and a software client, that's probably still the best way to do this stuff, if you want my opinion. Problem is, everyone else is doing more, making it more user-friendly by introducing certain levels of trust and active ongoing conduct, but it's that active ongoing conduct that could land you in jail, unfortunately. And finally, how broad can a conspiracy be? As I said, the Romans are being charged with conspiracy because the government can't prove that they made a sanctioned transaction. They never made any sanctioned transaction. They never made a transaction for North Korea. North Korea never gave them any money. They published software that ran on the Ethereum blockchain that was validated by validators on the Ethereum blockchain there was an AWS web server. If this conspiracy extends to Amazon Web Services, every Ethereum validator, all the people who've written the Ethereum core protocol, and Roman, who wrote the Tornado Cash protocol, then yeah, I guess all those people together moved money for North Korea. But that is an absurdly broad criminal conspiracy. Under that theory of liability, you could hold Linus Torvald liable for sanctions violation because Linux operates some of the computers that are refining uranium in Iran which it probably does, let's be honest. There has to be a limit here or we'll never be able to build the tools that we should be building to protect our privacy. With that, I hope I haven't scared you too much. Welcome to ETH Berlin. <laughs> okay, we have some time for questions. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Um, that all sounded very alarming, but um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, given the current um, shifting climate in, the, in real time in the, in the US political theater right now, do you think we, uh, we have brighter days ahead? Um, uh, yeah, has, has this been a, uh, a broader push by, the, by this current administration to persecute uh, the crypto ecosystem, and, and do, you, do you see any changes coming now? Thank you. So, it's a good question. And there are some reasons for optimism in the US. We have recently saw some legislation pass in Congress on bipartisan basis that's not terrible for crypto and is crypto relevant. It's a low bar for success for, the <laughs> for Congress, I suppose. But I think, uh, let me say this. Unfortunately, the world is a giant, chaotic, complex system and rarely acts in some sort of coordinated way, even when there's lumpy centralized powers within it. And why we've ended up in this bad position, it's not exactly a conspiracy. It might be that there's opportunistic prosecutors in the Southern District of New York who think they can stretch the application of liability for money laundering to software developers, and they could get civil asset forfeiture, and they could make a name for themselves as being the cop on the block on Ethereum just like the SDNY was the cop in the block for the global financial system during the days of Wall Street. That could be part of it. And that's just sort of one guy who's really powerful in this particular circumstance. Or it could be more coordinated. It could be the Biden administration. It could be persons within the Biden administration. It could be Elizabeth Warren's um, um, picks for, say, the SEC or for Treasury. 
which was part of her agreement to uh, bow out of the, uh, the last presidential election and endorse Biden. How do things get better? I think mostly things actually get better if we get lucky with the little things, like who's the prosecutor, who's the judge, who's the defense. We're actually very lucky that we have Judge Fala as the judge in the tornado cash case. She's very reasonable. She wrote the opinion in the Uniswap fraud prosecution. Plaintiffs suggested that Uniswap was responsible for scams because scammers sold tokens through an AMM that Uniswap wrote the software for. In her opinion, she said Uniswap can't be responsible for that. They wrote software that anyone could use. You're not responsible for bad people doing bad things with your software. If there's one judge I want in the Tornado Cash case, it would be her, because that's the exact same principle. They could still lose. I don't mean to be too optimistic, but I at least have a little bit of heart here. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, and also thank you to mentioning the country I was born as the most used example. Really refreshing. Uh, I want to ask. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to it. It's been 15 years I'm here. Uh, yes, and and I would mention Iran. I'm not mentioning Persia. <laughs> yeah, it's more accurate. Thank you. Um, I want to ask if I build like an application that enables people to anonymously contribute knowledge and get paid for it and let's say it goes to a self-custody wallet, and then they transfer it to an exchange to cash out, which probably is sanctioned. Would it cause problem for this uh, application? Sounds or if like I send to family and they send to that exchange, would that be a problem for me? So the app sounds like a whistleblower app, kind of? Um, no, it's basically for public goods, uh, general knowledge. It's not uh, for whistleblower. So I want to hesitate here because I don't want to be giving you legal advice specifically, but can you, can you repeat it? Um, so it's a, it's a crowdsourcing application, so people can contribute knowledge and, and get rewarded for it. And it could be in certain different domains in ecosystems. Uh, it's, it, it's not really sensitive knowledge. It's public. It could be on GitHub yeah. or uh, Wikipedia. It's, I mean, it, it's a good test case, but you don't want to be a test case for sanctions violations, right? But if you're brave and you do, talk to a lawyer about it. Because the Berman Amendments, as I said, and the Free Trade and Ideas Act, I mean, listen to the title that Congress passed. This was a law Congress passed. The Free Trade and Ideas Act says that sanctions aren't supposed to stifle directly or indirectly prevent the free spread of information across borders. Sounds like that's what your app does. So it'd be a good test case for whether that exemption actually carries the weight that it should. But I also don't want to see you go to jail, so talk to a lawyer. Okay, man, thank you. One more, no? Yes? <laughs> so there are some people who have been like sending phones from Tornado Cash to known like American addresses and stuff. Yes. Uh, how big of a problem are they really creating for those people? <laughs> That's a great question. So we call that the dusting attack, right? And um, after the sanctions were announced, a bunch of people, celebrities, I think Shaquille O'Neal was one of them because he had a known ENS name. Um, Jimmy Fallon was one of them, received small transactions through Tornado Cash. It's a problem for them. It's a problem because if you receive any sanctioned funds, any sanctioned property, you are obligated to report to OFAC that you received it, that you've isolated it, and you'll never touch it, you won't even look at it, and you're obligated to make that report yearly, and if you don't, and if you don't do it actually within a matter of weeks from receiving it, you're guilty of a federal felony. So it's serious. Wow. And I, you know, this is important because um, in Coin Center's lawsuit, we're one of the plaintiffs. We're suing because we're a nonprofit that takes donations. And we want to keep taking donations anonymously if people want to give to us anonymously. And we want to use Tornado Cash. One of our co-plaintiffs is a guy who got dusted from the Bankless podcast, David Hoffman. And <laughs> he's suing with us because it's good to show the judge all the range of people who are affected by this. Even a person who did nothing except have an e a publicly known ENS number is now obligated under sanctions laws to do costly reporting year after year after year. And I want to highlight the third plaintiff in our lawsuit because it's important, I think, to show that this is a broad coalition of people who just want good privacy tools. We have a John Doe in our lawsuit, whose name isn't revealed because of personal safety concerns. He was facilitating donations in ETH to the defense of Ukraine. 
And he was doing this for very obvious reasons, because if you fund Ukraine's defense without privacy tools, you're baiting the GRU, the Russian Secret Service. And so he is a co-plaintiff with us who simply wants to be an American who's able to facilitate the defense of Ukraine by sending private cryptocurrency transactions to the regime there. I hope we win. Thank you. Thank you so much.